In this Qualtrics tutorial, you're going to become familiar with the Qualtrics interface, and we're going to start to develop a deeper understanding of some of the hidden but extremely important menus and features, even if you're just conducting and developing basic online surveys. We'll actually implement some of those basic survey design questions in Qualtrics, and then more importantly, we're going to develop some understanding and skills to use some of the more advanced but commonly needed features in Qualtrics, such as display and skip logic, pipe text, loop and merge, and survey flow, or randomization. In addition, we'll learn how to conduct some basic testing of Qualtrics programming logic, and then we'll diagnose and solve some of these common issues to make sure that we're designing the survey that we intended to design. During this Qualtrics tutorial, we're going to imagine that we are a marketing research consulting firm that was hired by a soon-to-open, small, independent San Diego craft brewery. We have already collaborated with them and developed an online survey that we have designed to answer a variety of important questions that they'd like to have addressed that will navigate and influence their decision making for how they craft their beers and produce their tasting room. When I mean the survey was already designed, I mean that we've already sat down and actually designed every single question and how we want it programmed. And we did that in a simple Google Doc. We can presume that this work has already been done. We just have to actually successfully program this survey into Qualtrics so that it can be administered online. Don't worry, we'll get into how to use this document shortly. Simply typing phrases like, how do I insert the thing you're trying to do in your Qualtrics survey in Qualtrics will generally bring you to helpful support pages both through the Qualtrics website directly or through other tutorials available online show you how to do that. In addition, the Qualtrics support page is also very excellent. They have a great number of tutorials, videos, and walkthroughs that help you get through both basic and advanced functionality in Qualtrics. This video, on the other hand, is designed to help you get started from ground zero. The Google searching and Qualtrics support is often great, but sometimes it's even hard to know what you're looking for when you don't have a familiarity with what Qualtrics is and some of its powerful potential. So let's get started. Okay, so we have logged into Qualtrics from our appropriate portal for SDSU students. At this time, it is sdsu.qualtrics.com. Or alternatively, if you haven't created your account yet, you go to the Office portal and you'll find under all of your apps, you'll find SAP Qualtrics accessible to you. Either way, uh, since I have a bunch of projects already, I came to this default interface showing all my work. What we're going to be looking to do is to create a brand new project. And this will take us to the starting interface for creating a new project. It might look a little different for you. They've been updating this interface quite a bit lately. Um, in our case, we don't want to work from a project template. Actually, we want to build our project from scratch. So let's click the project from scratch button here. And let's go ahead and get started. I'll call this my craft beer survey. I have a bunch of folders that I've already created. You might not have any folders yet and I'll put it in my testing folder. Okay, now that we're in Qualtrics in our default survey builder screen here, we can see that our uncomplete surveys here sitting in the center. We have this thing called the default question block, a blank question to get us started. Now, if we look to the upper left-hand corner, we'll notice that we're in the survey tab. We're not going to be leaving this during this tutorial because we're actually building a survey. You'll also notice down the left hand side here there are different icons and we are in the builder portion right now and we'll be st spending most of our time here in the builder portion later we'll dabble in survey flow and we'll talk about what that's useful for now if we cast our eyes to the left hand side a bit more you'll notice that we have this default question selected and here's our editing pane we can do different things we can change the question type we can adjust the settings for that particular question. So for example, here we could allow multiple answers. Notice it's a checkbox now. We can change the number of choices. We can do a bunch of other additional formatting. We can add validation and requirements when people answer these questions. And then underneath here, which we'll get into several of these during the tutorial, we'll find a bunch of other ways to edit, modify, customize, and program individual questions. You can actually hide this pane. 
I keep it open though. I like to keep this nice and visible while I'm working. Now, when I hover over the individual question, you'll also notice that this question is nested within something called a block. Blocks are very important, a building tool here for Qualtrics. We'll understand a little bit more the importance of blocks. You'll usually have multiple blocks in your survey. Sometimes you'll have one survey question in a block. Sometimes you'll have multiple questions in a block. At this point, let's just think of it this way. When you have a bunch of survey questions that are conceptually grouped together, so the respondent would sort of think of them as all being about the same broad topic, usually you'll place those questions in their own block, and then you'll place differently themed questions in other blocks. On this introductory interface, you'll also notice several other details. We can add new questions right here. You also see some little dot, dot, dots hanging in the upper right hand corner of the question. It implies there's a bunch of additional features that are hidden even beyond the edit question pane that we can do to edit, modify, and make use of questions. And then the block itself that we're working with also has the ability to make new blocks and move things around and do additional work at the block level. Don't get worried if this feels a little overwhelming right now. We'll be touching on how to use each of these throughout this tutorial. Okay, now that we're comfortable with the basics of the Qualtrics interface, let's go ahead and start building on our survey. So let's swap back over to our Google Doc where the survey has been set up. And let's make sure we understand how to interpret the survey design here. We'll see that anything that's in black is text that'll actually be shown to the survey respondent. So these are like instructions, questions, or survey response options. If it's blue and in all caps, that's the actual variable name that'll be, that we would like to have stored for each one of the uh, items that is presented or asked of the survey respondent. So later, if we were analyzing this data in say Microsoft Excel, this would be the column heading. So we would actually know uh, what our data, or which uh, survey question our data is attached to. If we see something in red and in brackets, that means it's uh, some sort of survey logic that we're gonna have to actually program into Qualtrics. So it might be like skipping over a question if, if people answer a previous question in a different way. A green bracket lets us know we want to make a new block. And if it's orange, there's some additional tips or suggestions for programming and things that I've just provided to you that might help you along as you're working on this uh, yourself. Now keep in mind that we're going to be hopping back and forth between this Google Doc and Qualtrics frequently throughout this tutorial. And that'll be common while you're doing programming for your own projects. So never hesitate to pause and um, any point in the video and make sure that you can catch up and follow along. Okay, so our, with our introduction uh, block here, we first, of course, just want to introduce the survey to our respondents. So let's go ahead and simply highlight the text that we want to show them and copy it. And switch back over to here, where it says click to write question text for our first survey question. We just paste it in. You'll notice that none of the formatting came over like the return. But we can, of course, just add that in manually. Yes. So with that all set up, uh, you know, we might actually want to maybe bold something here, make it a little easier for people to see the most important information. So we could always click on the rich content editor. And maybe I will highlight this and see now we have the ability to actually do formatting, adjust a size, font, or just simple bold here. Maybe bold the incentive. Now, Doing this sort of manual formatting, italicizing, bolding, changing the font size or changing the font itself, you can certainly do it. And if you do that here, you will override the default settings of the formatting rules for Qualtrics. And now what do I mean by the default settings? So let's click out of here. And just to show this really quick, if we hit the survey preview in the upper right hand corner, we see that Qualtrics overlay some sort of default formatting and templating for how these survey uh, things are depicted. I'm going to close this tab. It's an extra tab that you don't see up there. Now, where did that come from? Well, that comes from over on the left-hand side here, the look and feel icon. I'll just show that what that is really quick. Notice that there's these different types of, and in my case, I just have a, a SDSU official and a blank template, but there's others. 
You notice by clicking here, it changes the font, changes the sizing, so on. But my bold, since I manually edited the bolding, it overrode whatever default templating rules that Qualtrics has and applied that. So I'm going to go back to my survey here. Now, something to keep in mind is because Qualtrics has its own formatting rules through these templates, uh, and you also have the ability to override them, that means you need to be very cautious about how those two things interact. So always check your survey preview as you're wrapping up uh, to make sure that aesthetically, the things that you've implemented into your survey on the style side uh, look the way that you intend. Now we're not quite done with this introduction question yet. First, we don't want to call this question Q1, which is just the default setting. You can click up here and we'll call this the intro Production. Okay. We also remember that we want to change the question block name. Intro question block. And lastly, this is not a survey question, right? This is just information. So we actually need to switch over our survey question, not from a multiple choice, but instead into a text and graphic question. And when I say question, it's not really a question at all, right? There's no options. But Qualtrics treats everything as a survey question. Okay. Now from here, we need to add a few more questions. So let's, right, we have a couple screening questions, so we can add a new multiple choice here. I'll add one more, so we know we have two to add. And if we happen to recall from our previous look at the Google Doc, we actually want a page break between this first question and the second. So we can add a page break right there. Page break meaning so when people take the survey, they see these questions on, or information on separate screens. Okay, so I'm just going to copy and paste over this information. For okay, and I pasted this over here. Clean up a little typo. Now, let's take a look at a few things that happened here. First, Look at this age question. Uh, when I pasted mine in, all of a sudden, this multiple choice question, Qualtrics tried to guess what the response option should be for this question. And it was very wrong. Uh, this is not a question asking how much someone likes something. See, it has the word like there, so it took a wild guess. Now, why did it do that? Well, if you look over here in our multiple choice menu here, the use suggested choices toggle turned on. And I'm going to turn that back off. And I'm going to actually add in the options that I wanted correctly. So I'm going to go back to my Google Doc, select my three rows of age, copy. And if I go over to the edit multiple for the choices, a little menu will pop up. And I can overwrite all of this default stuff for my three options that are actually appropriate. There we go. I also want to change this to screener one. And I want to change the second one to screener two. And I'll change the options doing the same procedure. Okay. Now, since these are screening questions, that means we absolutely need people to answer these questions. Now, by default, Qualtrics does not require people to answer questions. They can simply move past them. But these are, and that's and that's good practice. We we don't want to make people answer questions that they don't want that they don't feel appropriate or they don't want to answer. But in this case, we do need this information no matter what. So we can select our screener one here, and we can add a requirement, response requirements, and we can force a response. Our screener two. We can do the same thing. Let's test our survey here. We can go up to a preview again. Here's our information. Click on the next page. And we have our two questions here. Let's see what happens if I try to skip and not answer them. Aha, there's that validation. Now we also have to do some logic here, right? If people say that they're under 21 or over 35, we want them to be terminated from the survey. Or 
if they say no or I don't know to this question, we want to take them to the end of the survey. So a couple of ways to do this, perhaps the easiest in this instance, would be to add a skip logic. So select screener one, go down to question behavior and add a skip logic. And the skip logic says skip from this question to the end of the survey, right? That would kick someone out if 21 to 35 year olds is not selected, right? If they do not pick this option, which means they had to have picked the other two, we'll take them to the end of the survey. And you'll see that the skip logic is available for us to review right here. And we can do that for the screener down here as well. Add skip logic. And let's go ahead and test that. Notice that when we added the skip logic in, it automatically split the two questions. That's curious. That's just how it handles the application of the skip logic. It forces a page break between them because it checks the logic as it proceeds through in each additional question to where to skip people to. So if I say I'm over 35, it should kick me out of the survey, right? There we go. I can restart the survey and try it again. Now I pass the 21 to 35, so I should go to the next question. But if I say that I don't know if I, if I haven't made it to this or not, it should take me to the end. Okay, so that's one way to do it. Another way to do it, and we're going to learn a new resource here in Qualtrics, is what if we didn't actually want to use the skip logic because we wanted to show both of the questions on the page at the same time. So let's go ahead and just delete clicking on the dot, 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 the skip logics. So I, I no longer have that validation here. Instead, we're going to do the validation all in one shot at something called the survey flow. Now the survey flow is useful for a variety of reasons. It shows all of our blocks. In our case, we only have one right now. We can do all kinds of advanced conditional logic and other things here using this particular tool. So right now we're going to show our block intro question block and let's add something below it. And it gives us a bunch of options. Let's just focus in on this branch. So branch is the idea that we branch people to different parts of our survey depending on how they answer questions. In this case, we're going to branch people to the end of the survey. Remember, we're going to be adding more later, uh, but we're going to branch people immediately to the end of the survey if they do not correctly answer our two screening questions. So we need to add a condition here. So it says, all right, what is the if condition? So if this happens, where do you want to send people? So if on the screener one question, 21 to 35 year olds is not selected, we have a little plus here, or remember either one of these screening conditions disqualifies the person. So, or Screener two, yes, is not selected. So if either one of these things, that or that, is not true, we want to kick people out. So we now have our complex branching logic here. And then what? where do we want to send them? It says, well, send them to, in this case, we're just going to send them to the end of the survey. Right? This seems a little silly for now because we haven't built out the rest of the survey. But you could imagine this condition will take people to the end automatically, whereas as we build out more blocks in the survey, we'll take people who do qualify through the rest of the survey. So we can apply that logic here. Let's go back to our survey and preview it. So our introduction. And notice now that we have both of the questions on the same page. And if I say that I'm under 21 or I'm over 35, unfortunately I am over 35, womp womp. And I have been to a crap rotation in the last 30 days, so I still shouldn't qualify, right? Because I make one condition, but I miss the other, and my OR logic should still send me to the end. So what we learned so far is we learned how to build out some basic questions, we learned how to do basic formatting, and we learned two different ways 
to use to skip people to different parts of the survey, both the simple skip logic, which is often easy to use uh, and quick to use for very simple situations. We also learned how to start using the survey flow tool to build out um, skip conditions, which although a little more complex at first is much more powerful and is sometimes the necessary tool uh, as our surveys take on more and more programming requirements. Okay, with our first block complete, we're ready to proceed to the next part of the survey here. We call this the visit block. And let's take a look at what we're trying to achieve here uh, with these three questions. So for the visit variable, we're going to ask people uh, which brewery, brew pub, or tasting room did they most recently visit. Remember, we already verified they have visited in the last 30 days. We have a list of some popular locations, answer for other and I don't know. We're going to ask individuals to recall how much money they spent at that visit in U.S. dollars. And then we're going to follow up yet again and have them fill out a brand personality mini questionnaire related to that brand. So whether or not they thought that most recent visit brand was, in their mind, um, characterized by being genuine, friendly, down to earth, glamorous, and rugged. And these items come from a famous brand personality scale from Jennifer Aker. We have a lot of programming rules that we're going to need to deal with as well as we proceed through this particular task. So let's dive right into Qualtrics and we will build those out as we go. So I'm going to start here with the visited tasting room. So I'll just Notice that the visit block and the visited variable will be first, so I'll bring that over into Qualtrics. So now that we're in a new block, we can minimize the previous block and if it's tidier to work with. And I'll call this the visit block. We can add a new question. It's a multiple choice question. You can click in. And I pasted the text previously. And I can just follow the same approach that I had already learned to copy and paste over the new options. I'm just doing skills that we are familiar with, so I'm not spending time here to explain them. Now we need to pause here for a second now that we've added in these options. Notice there was a coding rule that said text entry. I don't actually want text entry to be there. We can actually click in on that option and edit it this way. But notice that when I click in on the actual survey question option, there's also a menu here. And oh boy, there's actually options to customize individual survey responses as well. And in this case, I clearly want people to have text entry as an option. Now, in addition, I did note that this was a very mission critical question for our survey. So even though we're always hesitant to do so, we do want to make sure that this is uh, required. So a force response. And we want to change the variable name to, let's take a look at our survey again, see what's coming up next. We're going to need to add two more questions. But what are these questions about? Well, for spend underscore visit, we want to ask people to recall how much money they spent at that visit. And interesting here is we actually want to carry the name forward from their previous answer. So if they typed in, or I'm sorry, if they selected pizza port, we'd want it to say pizza port. Or if for other, if they typed in a different brewery, uh, maybe Helm or some other brewery name here, they would see that name as well. It's always great when you can remind individuals of what's being evaluated rather than them, them requiring on their memory. So it's good practice sort of take information from previous parts of the survey and propagate that into future parts of the survey. So let's see how we can do that. So I'll paste this in. I'm taking note that some of this is stuff that I want to edit. Before I do that, I don't want this to be a multiple choice question at all. I want to change this to a text entry. And I want them to put in a numerical value. So I want to add some validation. And the validation is only a valid answer if the content type is a number with a minimum of zero. And for sake of just a sanity check, I'll say they can't type in anything more than $2,000, probably even a little high. So that'll just verify and check that their numerical answers are appropriate. Change the variable name to spend visit. And now for the big task here. How do I get the information from the previous question 
into this little area here, right? So I want that. And the way to do that is I just use this nice little feature here called piped text. It literally pipes text or information from other parts of the survey. It's like plumbing into another part of it. So we click on pipe text. Pipe text is going to be coming from a previous survey question, the one that I called visit. And there's a lot of options here. What we want is the selected choice. You'll notice that there's two options, selected choice, enter text, and selected choice. Well, here, if they answered the other question, I don't want them to see the phrase other, please enter name. I want them to actually see what they typed in. And otherwise, I want to just see Stone Brewery, Battles Point, or so on. So I will select the entered text entry here. And then notice like a little piece of code starting with a money sign and then enclosed in squiggly brackets is propagated. So this is literally like Qualtrics code. You could actually have typed this in by hand, which you should never do, but you certainly could do it. Um, and this should work just fine. Even with this other question not finished yet, let's preview this and see if it's working according to spec. Preview the whole survey. It's a short survey, so it's easy to do. Make sure I qualify for it. And I'll say that I've been to Pizza Port. Oh, and clearly something's not working quite right here. Here we have, when I selected Pizza Port, it didn't carry that information forward. What's going on? Well, the problem is Qualtrics never had an opportunity to take this information from this question, store it up in their server, and then bring it back down into this question. So we can fix that very easily. Let's go back to our survey editor. All we need to do is add a page break between these two. Now let's preview it one more time. There we go. Notice that now that it was able to store and send that information up to the server, it's able to pull that information right back down. Okay, let's go finish up this other question and away we go. Okay. Just going to copy this over quickly as we've done previously. And this time we're going to, have to change up our options here a little bit. Notice that for this particular survey question, we actually have, it's really multiple survey questions. Notice we actually have five survey questions then each one of them with a descriptiveness response label. So this is going to call for something called, I'm going to uh, call a matrix table. So I switch from multiple choice here to a matrix table here. And notice now I can have multiple questions all in one place and response options. So these statements, I can edit these statements, same way I have previously, edit multiple statements. I can paste in those words. And also, I want to multiple edit those scale points, and I can grab, copy, and paste those labels, not at all descriptive, to extremely descriptive over here as well. Great. Oh, in the name, brand eval. There we go. All right. Good work. And let's pause for a second here, and we're going to learn something new about how to code. Now, something I haven't really considered until now is how exactly is Qualtrics going to be storing this information? For example, when someone is answering this question, about whether or not a, the brand they're thinking about is genuine and they select that it is not at all descriptive, I'm sure that Qualtrics will store that information that it's not at all descriptive as text. But what if later I want to do some sort of numerical or quantitative analysis to this where I treat this as like a rating scale where not at all descriptive is like a low score and extremely descriptive is a high score? Is Qualtrics going to store these values as 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 going up? Or is it actually going to store it the other way, where not at all descriptive is 5, going down to extremely descriptive being 1? How do I check that? 
Well, that's actually really easy to do with your question selected. Just scroll down a little further here and click on the recode values. And you can see here by default, Qualtrics is, store, is going to store the not at all descriptive as a one and so on up to five. And I like this. I'm not going to actually change anything here. I think it makes sense that high values are, in my brain, are associated with things being extremely descriptive of them. So I think that intuition is, is better than flipping around the scoring. But if I wanted to, I could click this and I could recode the values so that they're stored as different numerical values. I could even change the variable naming. This is how it's actually stored in the underlying database. I wouldn't edit the survey that the user sees. And I could also edit the question export tags, which again, since there's five survey questions here, each one has been underscored with an underscore one, two, three, four, and five. Now I could change these as well, where the underscore five down here for rugged, I could change it to say rugged. So again, this is not editing the survey as seen by the user, but rather this is editing the survey in terms of how the data file will be presented and coded to the analyst who will be making sense of the data later. Luckily for us, I'm comfortable with the way it is set right now. We don't need to do any detailed editing or modifications here, but now we do know where to find that if we need to do so. Let's go ahead and preview our block here. I have a feeling there might be a little problem still lurking that we haven't accounted for yet. So let's see, which tasting room? Yeah, I don't remember. What happens if someone doesn't remember? Oh no. If someone doesn't remember, the carry forward logic still brings the I don't know option forward. Well, that's certainly not what we wanted. Okay, we don't want to ask these questions to people who can't recall the brand that they're thinking about. We're going to need to fix that. Again, this is easy to do. Now, unlike the previous example, we don't want to skip people based on this question. Instead, what we're going to do is we're going to sort of flip things around. We're going to use what's called a display logic. So when do we want to show people this spend visit question? Well, we can go to the question behavior of display logic and it says we will show this question if for the visit question, I don't know, was not selected. So if they set, selected anything else, we do in fact want to ask them that question. So we'll save that. And we need to do that down here as well for display logic. And now there's one final thing I want to modify in this particular block. You know, I was looking up at this first question here. And of course, I want the other and I don't know options to be at the bottom, but I did realize that the way that I've ordered the presented options of the other breweries, it's almost like Stone Brewery might have sort of an advantage in the minds of consumers, right? As they look through these options, the first one that they see is Stone Brewery. So maybe that's going to be the one that they recall, even if it's not the absolute correct answer. In other words, I'm concerned there's some sort of order bias. Now, I have to present things in some sequence, but maybe I can mitigate the risk of this order bias uh, by randomizing the sequence that these first six options are presented. And luckily, Qualtrics makes it very easy to do that. We can simply select the question, go to question behavior, go to choice randomization, and we have to do advanced randomization here. We're going to Take our fixed display order. Notice it's in the current fixed sequence, but I actually want to randomize these first six. So I put them over in the randomized bin here. And now when I save this, let's preview that. And actually, I don't even need to dive all the way back to the original survey and hit the preview button on the whole survey. I can just click on this individual block, the little dot, dot, dot icons, and I can preview this individual block. I don't need to worry about the previous stuff anyways. So let's preview this block. And just right away, we can see that the randomization clearly worked because these six options are 
random order. So we've learned a bunch of new skills here in this little video clip. We learned about a couple different question types. We learned about validation, display, and question response order randomization. Let's proceed to the next part of our survey. For this next part of our Qualtrics survey, let's take a look at both of the next two blocks simultaneously and set a game plan out. So for this IPAs block, we have a list of some beers. These are all India Pale Ales, popular beers amongst craft beer drinkers. And we want to have respondents indicate which of the beers that they've consumed in the last 30 days. Now, that'll be a simple checkbox question where people can select all that may apply. But what's important here is if we look down below at what's being called the loop block. Now, for those beers that the individual might select, we want them to evaluate how they feel about those particular beers on a semantic differential scale, a common scale used in marketing research, along the dimensions of whether they perceive the beer as bitter or sweet, unique or typical, or complex or simple. Now, of course, different people may select none, one, or more of the above options. So we want to loop this set of questions, the semantic differential questions, for each one of the unique options that they select. So we're going to use an advanced feature in Qualtrics called the loop and merge to accommodate that goal. Let's see that in action next. Okay, so we first simply add a new block. We have a new blank block here that we'll call IPAs. We're going to add one new question, a multiple choice question. And we'll just copy and paste over the information as we've done previously. Okay, now we do, do have to make a few modifications here. First, of course, we have to allow people to make multiple answers. So we just switch this from allowing one answer to allowing multiple. Now we have a checkbox. And for the none of the above, the programming rule said that we want to make this an exclusive answer. And of course, we don't want to show that text. But if we select the options under none of the above here, remember, we can edit the options of individual questions. We can actually select a choice that says make answer exclusive. And we'll see a little icon that pops up here. And what that does is if someone is checking the none of the above, of course, that means they shouldn't be able to check any of the available options. So if they check the none of the above, it'll exclude or eliminate any other options that they have. And again, because there's going to be some programming involved with utilizing this question in the next block, we're going to want to make sure that this question has to be answered so that it functions properly. So we will add requirements here and force a response to this particular question. Now we're going to add yet another block, and we'll call this our loop and merge block. It doesn't have to be called that, but our loop and merge block. And now let's set up our semantic differential question here. Now for our loop and merge question, we need to add a matrix table, which we've done previously. And we, again, we can just sort of copy and paste over the question and the options. So let's do that. Okay, now clearly there's a few things that we need to fix right here. First, of course, we want to name this particular variable. But clearly we're going to bring some programming language over here so that people are, know which brand name they're evaluating. But also our semantic differential, well, the characteristics of a semantic differential scale is kind of unique where we don't actually have score points along the top or labels for each one of the options, but rather they are on the left and right hand side of the scale. So what we do here is we just switch our matrix from a Likert to what's called a bipolar. So bipolar adjective scale is another name for a semantic differential. So we'll see here where it says bitter and sweet. Actually, the right hand side should say sweet, not this. And we just modify the rest accordingly. And we can just make sure that it has five scale points as intended. OK. Now, the next thing that we need to do is actually set up this loop and merge. Remember, people may select none, one or more options from the options above here. 
Now, programming a loop and merge is actually a block level criteria, so not at the question level. So if we select the block overall, I'm clicking on it here, we see we can set up on the upper left-hand side here the loop and merge settings. Let's do that. We have to turn on the loop and merge. And we want this to loop based off answers to a previous question. So let's select the option here. Let's find our beer names question and all of the selected choices. So see here how all of them are propagated into this field, but of course the loop order that's presented will only be based on those that are shown. Notice that it might show the none of the above option in the loop. We'll deal with that later. For now, let's just ignore that problem. Now that our loop and merge has been set up, you can tell by the loop and merge icon here in the upper right, we can complete this little piece of piped text programming that we were waiting to finish because we want to show the actual brand name, right? So we can delete this. We can go back to our piped text feature that we were a little familiar with from earlier in the survey. But this time, where we're going to be piping text from isn't from a previous survey question, which can be tricky, but instead we're actually going to be piping that information from the loop and merge that we just set up. So go to the loop and merge in the loop and merge fields. Remember in that little table that we saw previously, the field one was where the names of the beers were. And there, right there is the name for the loop and merge setup. Excellent. Now, we haven't actually previewed the survey yet, but I'm going to be bold and dive ahead and, and finish up what I think is the last piece of required programming before we test this. The one issue that I know is going on is that the none of the above option, if someone selects that, we should never take them to the actual loop and merge set of questions. So how can I fix that? The solution to that is if we use our survey flow tool, now that we're in our survey flow, we see that our branch rules that I had shown earlier is one of the options for how to do our screening questions, which I left in my survey. I actually is at the end of the survey, so it won't be evaluated. That's, that's not quite right. As we've added more blocks, that became a problem. So I will just click the move button and drag this back up where I wanted it, which is after the intro question block where the screening questions are. Anyways, let's go back to our IPAs block. This is where we ask people which IPAs they've drank. Let's add a survey flow criteria below that. So let's add a branch. And let's add a condition. And if for beer names, they select none of the above, if that's selected, I don't actually want to take them to the loop and merge. So I can actually create a new direction in my add a new element here. In this case, I, just, I could just take them to the end of the survey, or if I wanted to add additional blocks or other things that I might still build up later, other parts of the survey I still want them to take, I could add that. For now, let's just imagine we want to end the survey if they said none of the above here. Otherwise, the person will continue on the survey and be shown the loop and merge. Now, if you're confused about any of these intermediate steps, of course, you could just do this step by step and test it with a survey preview. We're going to apply this and we're going to test all of this in one big shot in the video here. So let's go back to our survey, hit preview overall. We have to test many blocks at once. So we have to make sure we qualify as we move through. That brings us to our option here. So let's select delicious IPA and relay. So the loop and merge question should happen twice for the two beers that I selected. And looking at the words below, please select the position on the scale that indicates how you personally evaluate Delicious IPA Stone Brewery. Great, we can evaluate that. And the Relay IPA. Great. Okay, so it worked as I intended. Good stuff. Now we can take a look at our final steps in our survey where we learn a little bit more about actually implementing experiments in Qualtrics. For the final component of this Qualtrics survey, we're going to build a basic experiment inside Qualtrics. So let's take a look at our objective here. In this setup, we want to do a simple A-B test, also known as a between subjects post-test only experiment. We want to show the individual one of two at random package designs for a beer. And then once they see the beer, we want them to evaluate that particular six pack of beer on 
four different questions using a standard five-point Likert scale. So there's a variety of different ways to implement experimental design within Qualtrics. The way that I'm going to show here in this video uses what's called a within block design, meaning we will never have to use the survey flow tool. I've already downloaded these two images onto my local machine, so we'll be able to upload them quickly into the Qualtrics system and proceed with the exercise. So we simply add a block. We can call it experiment. And the way that this is going to work is we're going to actually add three placeholder questions. The first one here is actually going to be a simple texture graphic. We'll call that image A. The second one will also be simple placeholder texture graphic image B. And as you might guess, each one of these will represent where we upload each one of the respective images to. Then finally down here, this will be our matrix style set of questions using the Likert scale. And I'm going to just quickly copy and paste that over using skills we already have. Now here, for using suggested scale points, notice it's starting off at none at all to a great deal, which is not correct. But if we use the suggested scale points and click on the menu, we'll notice that agree to disagree, in other words, the standard Likert scale, is already readily provided to us, so we don't have to do any extra work. That's nice. Okay, now let's go ahead and upload these images. Pretty easy to do. Just click in here, go to Rich Content Editor, and click on the insert graphic icon. And I have a variety of different images for previous projects, but I need to upload my new graphics. So just click this icon here and do standard upload. And once it's uploaded, I probably don't want to keep the click to write question text. I'm going to do the same to image B, same using the same procedure. Okay, both images have been uploaded. Now, I want to test this within the block. So if I select my whole block overall, click on the dot, dot, dot in the upper right and preview the block, we should anticipate that it's not correct right now, right? The respondent sees both images, and then they're supposed to look at the image above. We only want to show one of those images. How do we do that? Well, it turns out at the block level, we also have a question randomization feature. So let's take a look at that. Here, we can set up advanced randomization. And we'll notice that our question QID10 QID 11, these are the two images. They kind of have a weird tag because there's no text inside of them. But trust me when I say that these are the two images. What we can do here is we can select both of them and add them into the random subset part of the randomization feature. And we can randomly insert just one of the questions from this list. So by doing this, the person will only see one of the two at random, making this a true experiment. Now the random subset, I can click on this and nudge it above so it will be shown above where the actual questions are. And I can save this, hit the save button again, and let's preview it one more time. Great, works wonderfully. If I hit the restart block at random, we do see a new different version of the image. So we have a true experiment. We could compare the results between these two package designs and see how people evaluate the two and see if one has one or more statistically significant differences and how people evaluate it across these four questions. Great. At this step, this has wrapped up the basic introductory and intermediate tutorial into designing marketing research surveys for online distribution using Qualtrics. Of course, there's a wide array of additional features that can be useful for different projects. And we haven't even talked about distributing your survey, 
and other advanced programming features. In addition, this survey uh, and tutorial really shot past a lot of the important characteristics and work that goes into designing appropriately worded and designed surveys. Instead, in this brief tutorial, I focused on actually implementing those uh, principles uh, and technology within the Qualtrics system. Make sure you check out my other videos, lectures, and other resources available online to make sure that when you're designing and writing your actual survey questions, you're adhering to best practices. Thanks for watching and listening, and good luck Qualtricksing.